Paul, welcome back. Good morning. So last week, we continued this theme in John of the old giving way to the new. John the Baptist is going to decrease. Jesus will increase, right? John came as preparation. Jesus comes as the fulfillment. Likewise, now the, the old wine, the water will change into new wine, right? Um, and the cleansing of the temple indicates the purpose of the temple is drawing to a close as well. It was always preparatory, pointing forward to a sacrifice to come. Now in Christ, that sacrifice is here. So the purpose for the temple, the sacrifices, is drawing to a close. And now, we're going to find more of this old giving way to new in the man Nicodemus. So this this part of scriptures is often called uh, the Nicodemus discourse, that is Jesus' discussion, his, his preaching to Nicodemus. Let us pray. O Lord, what blessing to be near thee and to hearken to thy voice. May I ever love and fear thee that thy word may be my choice. Oft were hardened sinners, Lord, struck with terror by thy word. But to him for sin grieveth comfort sweet and hope it giveth. Lord, thy words are waters living where I quench my thirsty need. Lord, thy words are bread life-giving. On thy words my soul doth feed. Lord, thy words shall be my light through death's veil and dreary night. Yea, they are my sword prevailing and my cup of joy unfailing. Amen. Okay. Verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the structure of this is that we get an introduction, who is Nicodemus? And then we get the first of Nicodemus' three questions. Now, we ended chapter 2 with this very short section here in verses um, 23 and 24 of chapter 2, where John tells us that Jesus did not entrust himself to anyone there at the temple because he knew what was in men. Keeping that in your mind then, John said, there was a man of the Pharisees. Right? That's not a coincidence. That is to say that Jesus knows what's in the heart of man. And now here comes one of those men, specifically Nicodemus. Right? So, bearing all of that in mind, and what is in the heart of men? Sin. Sin, unbelief, doubt. Right? Even, even on the best day, their, their knowledge and their faith is wildly imperfect sometimes. So, especially now. So that with all of the sin, with all of the darkness, with all of the uh, you know, lack of knowledge, lack of wisdom, here comes Nicodemus. So Nicodemus is not only a man, he's a man of the Pharisees. And so bring with you all of your knowledge of the Pharisees. The Pharisees are Jews. That is to say, they are synagogue goers. The synagogues are the dwelling place of the Pharisees. The Sadducees, by contrast, dwell in the temple. The Pharisees are taught by rabbis. A rabbi is kind of a professional cleric who teaches the word in the synagogue, right, where they gather together. And Obviously, he has been well taught. The Pharisees were very well educated. And they spend their time in prayer and in reading the scriptures, going going over and over again. Now, with the Pharisees, what do we know about the Pharisees' doctrine of scripture? Well, 
Did they have the books of Moses? Yes. yes. Did they have the prophets? Yes, yes they did. Right? Um, of all of the, the, the sects that were extant at the time of Jesus' uh, earthly sojourn, the Pharisees were far and away the closest to the kingdom. Certainly this must have been one of the sources of Jesus' frustration with them. You have the whole Bible. You're not screaming libs like the Sadducees. Why don't you get it? Because the Sadducees, remember, they have the books of Moses, but they don't have the prophets. So if Jesus makes an appeal to, let's say, Ezekiel, to the Sadducees, they're going to say, you have this too, by the way, you Lutherans, when you try to talk about St. Paul with someone who goes to a church with a rainbow flag outside. He was a man. Ironically, they will sometimes accuse the man who literally wrote Galatians by the power of the Spirit to be Judaizing. <laughs> well, right, right, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a favorite trick of theirs to, to put a wedge between Paul and Jesus. You know, Jesus, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, though last week he cleansed the temple. Paul, big meanie. Yeah. Don't, don't get fooled by that trick. Um, but he's a Pharisee. In other words, he should know the Bible. He should have a good grasp of the Bible. And that's a good question. Why didn't they get it? Right. I well, I mean, yeah, Jesus himself is surprised. He's, he's flummoxed. What? We'll get there. Um, so Nicodemus, it's a great name, by the way. It means the victory of the people. One of my children has a middle name of, of Nicole, which is the feminine form of Nicholas, the victory of the people. Um, and we're told he's a ruler of the Jews. That is to say, he's, he sits on the Sanhedrin, right? They, they judge. They're kind of, a, they're kind of a, a, an earthly authority made up of, of churchmen specifically for the governing of the Jews, right? The Roman, the, the, the Roman imperial system permitted some measure of local rule, so they didn't have to deal with it, right? You, you guys have, a, have some dis, dispute over what the books of Moses means, and the Romans want nothing to do with it. You people deal with it. And that's why Pilate and Herod bounced Jesus back and forth to each other, right? Um, now, we're told he comes to Jesus by night. Again, it's not just... Well, the time of day in which Nicodemus had his question just happened to be when the sun was on the other side of the earth. No, 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 no. We were told at the beginning of the gospel, Jesus is the light that's come. The darkness could not overcome it. However, we're also told that men prefer the darkness, right? Darkness here again is not, it's not an accident. It's not just a, well, that's what time he happened to have his question. He's coming by night for a couple of reasons. One of them it seems he's kind of embarrassed. He doesn't want to be seen in the light. And this is very common with wicked men, right? When is crime the worst? At night. Why? People don't want to be seen breaking into people's houses at, at, at high noon. You, you, do, you do your deeds in the night to hide what you're doing. And that's why Nicodemus is here at night. He's hiding it. Why? Because the Sanhedrin... Has, remember, we've already had some, some experiences with the Jews back uh, during the ministry of John the Baptist. And John calls them a brood of vipers. So John knows what they're about. He knows what they want. Their, their deeds have already been exposed. And now, here comes not just any old Pharisee, not just some you know, low-tier rabbi, this guy could be in a lot of trouble. He stands to lose a lot if it were known that he's even being friendly to Jesus. Right, so, I mean, you, you can kind of imagine the, the Sanhedrin sitting around going, that Jesus, oh, can you believe what he said? He's, and then, did you hear what he did in the temple? Outrageous! You know, you can just imagine them tearing their robes, right, and doing all the, doing the bit. But, some of the Pharisees, some of the Sanhedrin, and Nicodemus, by using the plural, the first person plural, we, seems to indicate he's speaking on behalf of others. How many? I don't know. But some. 
And obviously, they're hearing what Jesus is teaching and seeing what he's doing, and they're not full-on believers, but they're much friendlier to Jesus than the rest of the Sanhedrin would have them be. So he comes by night. Now, to be fair, Jesus will give him some very blunt responses. But he does receive him. He does entertain the question. Jesus doesn't just say, go away, I know what you're about. He talks with Nicodemus. He, he hears the question, and, and so... Um, What is, what is Nicodemus' position? What does he believe? Well, we know, again, he's speaking for others, we know that you are a teacher come from God. There's been the water into wine already, there's been the cleansing of the temple, and there's a recognition, okay, this guy is obviously from God. That's not exactly a confession of Jesus as the only begotten Son of God. It's a start. He's come from God as the prophets came from God. And he knows that because of the signs. That's what he says. We know that no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And again, there, there have been lots of signs all throughout the Old Testament that, that testify of, you know, to the truth of, of the word of the prophet. Michaelmas sneaks up on you, you know. Um, so. The nature of Nicodemus' question, and it is kind of a question. Every teacher knows this. Kids will sometimes ask, ask questions, even if what they say is not grammatically finished with a question mark. Like, I don't understand this. They're asking a question, right? What does this mean? So Nicodemus makes a statement, which is really a question. Okay, so what, what's the nature of the kingdom here? How am I going to receive it? Jesus answers the question not by, not by entertaining it exactly the way that it's phrased. He doesn't say, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am come from God. Jesus knows what's in man's heart. He knows what Nicodemus is really driving at. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, and again, truly is, is simply here a translation of a word that we know very well, and that is amen, right? Right? In older translations, it's going to say, Amen, Amen, verily I say unto thee. Um, so that, that truly here is simply Amen. And, and look at what, what, what authority is Jesus pointing to? What authority is Jesus pointing to? I say to you. Yeah, his own authority. He does this in his preaching all the time. He doesn't go, well, you know, actually, Rabbi so-and-so held that this was, was a possibility. This is how rabbis talk. Right. By the way, it's not in any way unique to the Jews, not unique to the Pharisees. Well, you see, uh, Rabbi Kretzmann said that Rabbi Walther said that Rabbi Luther said that Rabbi Augustine said, we're totally guilty too. But... Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't, he doesn't have to amass up all of these other authorities. He simply says, this is how it is, because I say so. Now, it's not fallacious reasoning if he is, in fact, an authority. And, of course, we know he is. But notice, notice what he answers. He says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Um, so he, he, tells, he tells Nicodemus, if you wish to see the kingdom of God, it's going to have to be through some means other than what you're expecting. In other words, he knows what Nicodemus expects. So again, as a Pharisee, he is going to think that salvation comes by works. That the purpose of the law of Moses is to show the works I must do in order to be saved. And there is evidence of this all over the Gospels, that this is what Pharisees believe. And so Jesus knows what is in the heart of men. He knows what's in the heart of the man, Nicodemus. And so he cuts through the, the, the statement, the question behind it, and gets at what Nicodemus really needs most, which is, if you want to see the kingdom of God, now wait a minute, 
see the kingdom of God. It's a sure that Nicodemus is going to see the kingdom of God. He's a ruler of the Jews. He's a, he's a member of the Sanhedrin. If anyone is going to see the kingdom of God, surely he will, right? Maybe, maybe not. This kingdom is not coming the way you expect, dear Nicodemus. And it's going to come not, not so much by a, a matter of self-improvement. Jesus doesn't just say, you know, I'm going to give you 12 bullet points to take home and work on, and you'll, you'll get a little better, and then, then you'll see the kingdom of God. As, as if to say, you know, you're, you're kind of on the right track, but let me steer you a little closer to the kingdom here. Nicodemus, you are so far off that for you to see the kingdom of God, it is going to be required for you to have another birth. Now, about the nature of that birth. Jesus says you must be born, and you must be born again. The word born here, the, the Greek word for this really refers to um, the father's part in, um, in children coming into the world, which is to say, you must be begotten. It can, in a lesser sense, refer to being born, uh, but for the most part, it's going to refer to being begotten, right, as sons. And this is how the gospel speaks of all of us, that we are adopted as sons. Even female Christians are adopted as sons because sons means you inherit, right? Women Christians also inherit the kingdom. They're adopted as sons. You must be begotten, right? In other words, you must be born differently. So it's, it's not just a matter of, let, let me show you how to improve yourself. You must be an entirely different manner of creature if you want to see the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so what does that mean? What, what sort of birth is it? Jesus, Jesus says so in an adverb, modifying this verb, born. And our English translations basically uniformly use the phrase again. There are two ways to take this word. The, the Greek word here is anothen, right? It can either mean again meaning a second time, or it can mean from above. Now, John does this a lot. Jesus does this a lot, especially in John, where there's wordplay going on. As an aside, I've mentioned before that, that the, the, the language being spoken here is almost always going to be Greek. We know that Jesus and Nicodemus are speaking in Greek because this misunderstanding can only happen in the Greek tongue. In Hebrew, the words are wildly different. I'm not sure that anyone was, was using Hebrew by the time of Nicodemus. Not Ar Armenian. I mean, no. Uh, uh, Aramaic? Aramaic? No. I think even in the synagogue they're using Greek. And G Jesus quotes the Greek Old Testament verbatim most of the time. So again, is the under, this is a biblical understanding. This translation again is a biblical understanding it, because Nicodemus is in the Bible. <laughs> Nicodemus thinks Jesus means again. What, what Jesus really means is from above, right? In other words, it's not your birth went wrong, you have to go through it again. That's what Nicodemus hears. In fact, that's what Nicodemus says in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? It's, it's foolish. And he, he's, he's... I don't know that he's making light of it. He's, he's wrestling with it. But this is obvious foolishness to him. 
Right. Nicodemus is thinking, you must be born again. But what Jesus is saying is, you must be begotten from above. Well, consider your first birth. Your first birth, that is what we typically call birth, is from fleshly parents. Flesh and blood come from flesh and blood. And we inherit from flesh and blood the sin of our parents. And so Jesus is saying, it's not just try harder, it's not do better. It's not be the change you wish to see in the world or any other Buddhist concept like that. It's, yeah, right. (laughs) It's, you have to be a different manner of creature. You have to be a different sort of, of person beginning with a completely different birth, a different manner of birth, right? Obviously, crawling up inside of one's mother and coming back out again is not going to do anything. This, this, is, this is what Nicodemus is talking about. He's not understanding the ambiguity of that word. Jesus answered, verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Honestly, we could spend a couple of months on verse 5, and given where we live, would be time well spent. Um, So so what does born again tend to mean? Um, Not not to spoil the ending, but in verse 5, Jesus is talking about what we call baptism. He's, He's speaking plainly about baptism. And having a good theology of baptism, when you read verse 5, you're like, oh yeah, it's baptism. It's, it's, it's obvious to you because you've, you're catechized. You understand what's going on. Um, for those who, who do not understand that baptism actually you know, is, is regenerative. And by the way, what does regenerative mean? Makes a new. Makes a new born, born again, right? Um, when typically, when, especially in, in the American South, when people talk about being born again, what they're talking about is a conversion experience done done during a time in which one is conscious enough to be, in their minds, held accountable, right? Now, in in my experience, this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, so the people brought up with that expectation will often, as a matter of course, when they're teenagers, seek out those who, who do bad things so they can have something to be delivered from. Because then you have a testimony. I mean, imagine if I had to stand up and give my testimony. Well, God elected me before the foundation of the world, and he caused me to be born to Christian parents who took me to the waters of baptism and brought me up in the church. And there was never a point in my life in which I didn't consider myself a Christian. That's a really boring testimonial. Right, you don't, you don't write hymns and sell books on that. Right. 50 years right, 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 exactly. So, so I, I really do think it becomes for, for, for people that, that think of born again as being this experience that you almost have to hit rock bottom, maybe seek out rock bottom so you can have something to be delivered from. Now, now I would say that by virtue of being born of flesh and blood, I had plenty to be delivered from. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. I want to be of the spirit, which meant I needed another birth, which I got on March 23rd, 1980 at Calvin United Presbyterian Church, where the Reverend uh, Clyde P. Hinton Sr., my great-grandfather, baptized me in the triune God. It is necessarily a part of decision theology. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's necessarily a part of decision theology, which is what Jesus is undoing in verse 8, that the ways of the spirit are not known to man. The wind blows where it wills and you don't see it, right? Um, Now, many times they will talk about birth of water and birth of the Spirit being separate events, 
right? That, well, there's baptism of water, but then there's baptism of the Spirit. Or they'll say water baptism and spirit baptism. Now, water baptism is about as useful a phrase as car driving or food eating. Yes, of course you're eating food. What else would you eat? Yes, you're driving a car. What else would you drive? Yes, you're baptized in water. What else would you be baptized in? There is, didn't we have this in church the other day? One Lord, one faith, one baptism, not two baptisms, right? There's not a baptism of water and a baptism of the Spirit. This is a rhetorical device. In Greek, it's called a hendiasis, where one describes one thing using two words, right? Garth Brooks will describe rodeo as being of mud and blood. Well, there is one rodeo of mud and there's one rodeo of blood. No, it's, it's the same event, right? So it is with baptism. You didn't think that was coming, did you? <laughs> I, and you know what? I didn't either. <laughs> I didn't know it was coming either. So, <laughs> so it is with the Spirit. <laughs> That's right. He's describing one thing with two words. It is a new birth of water in the Spirit. It's not, well, there are two new births. That'd be like three births. This is describing one act which we call baptism, right? That's a, that's a good working definition of baptism, isn't it? One being born from above by water in the Spirit. People sure get confused. Yeah, turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus 3.3. 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Now that describes the old life, doesn't it? How are we naturally born? That's us. Verse 4. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Now again, who saved us? He saved us, not I I saved myself, but God saved us. How? By what means did God save us? What did he do? Not because of works done by us in righteousness. Right? That's in, in the letters of Paul, those are called particuli exclusivi, exclusive particles that exclude the possibility of salvation by works. He doesn't merely say salvation is by faith. He says salvation is by faith apart from works, not by works done by us in righteousness. <clears throat> okay, so if it's not by this, how is it? He tells us. But according to his own mercy, that's grace alone, right? How? How does God save us by grace alone? Like Paul tells us. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. What's this washing and pouring out language? That, that's water language. That's baptism. As a matter of fact, in the catechism, you'll find that this is the third of the Sadius doctrine I use to describe holy baptism. So, the, the, so you've asked two questions. The first question is, how do you get it wrong in not seeing this as baptism? And the answer is because you have in the back of your mind a prior, uh, and, and you know, a, a prior is like an unquestioned assumption that just is there, and you haven't really examined why it's true. We all have these, by the way, things that we believe, not because we examined them and came to a conclusion, but because they, they're part of our thinking, with, and without them, our thinking means nothing, right? For many people, their unexamined conclusion is, I must choose to believe, right? That, so that really what's at stake in defining baptism correctly is we first have to define faith correctly. And just ask yourself the question, can an infant believe? The answer in the Bible is a resounding yes. Not only is it a yes, by the way, infants are better at believing than we adults are because we have a thousand questions and we doubt and we go, well, but modern science says, or but, but reason tells me, or my experience tells me, or my emotion tells me, or but if that's true, then, then this person, infants don't do that. What can they do? They can say amen. And that's why Jesus takes, and the Greek word there, brephos, means a babe in arms, like one you have to carry because they're not mobile yet. 
Jesus puts a little one, a brephos, an infant, in the midst of the disciples and says, unless you be like that one, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's not, the infants will learn to be like us. We at our best need to learn to be like them, to simply take what God says and say, amen. Even if reason doesn't, doesn't understand it. The other question, works righteousness, that's simply the opinion of the flesh. That's, that's kind of the natural default position for man's reason. And you see this in the Pharisees, you see this in, in I mean, any, any religion that, that teaches that works are what, are what save us. It's funny you say that. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's all turn to Ezekiel 36. You're after what Jesus is after. Because <laughs> you're right, they should have known this. So Ezekiel 36, um, yeah, look at, let's, let's look at verse 25. These are a lot of kind of what we would consider end times prophecies or prophecies for a time in the future from Ezekiel's day. And, you know, the Lord says, the nations will know that I'm the Lord uh, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries. Wait, he's going to gather Israel from all the countries? So that when Paul says the church is the new Israel, that's also not new. It's in, it's in Ezekiel 36. Right? We are the Israel gathered from the nations. Abraham is, in fact, our father because, like Abraham, we believe God's promise. And then, look at verse 25. I will sprinkle... Oh, not immerse. Uh, it's, it's not a minor point. There, there, are, there are those who would cause you to doubt your baptism because they, it, it was not done in the way they think it ought to have been done. And we don't insist on one way or the other because no one can. No one, no one dare say my baptism wasn't genuine because my great-grandpa poured water on my head instead of dunking me. I was three months old. Dunking a three-month-old, that's just weird. But, but look, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And, okay, so first of all, the washing is renewing, right? It, it cleans, it cleanses. And as Peter tells us, it's not just washing dirt away from the skin. It's the pledge of a good conscience toward God. Okay, well, but what's this whole new birth matter? Well, look what he says. I will give you a new heart. It's not, I'll take your heart and fix it up. You know, we'll, we'll find what's wrong and we'll just, we'll just set it right. No, so deep is our sin, our heart must be taken out and a new one put in. And it's not just one that's slightly better than the old one, it comes from a different manner. That's why we're not born again, Nicodemus. We must be born from above. Our new heart is to come from God. It is to be godly, it is to be filled with the Spirit. And here, here in Ezekiel, he promises already, and again, a Pharisee should know Ezekiel. It's in his Bible. I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So there's the relationship between baptism, justification, and sanctification. It begins with God removing the heart of stone, giving us a heart of flesh. And here, by the way, flesh is not, flesh is not the dead one. It's in contrast to stone right? Stone is the dead one. Flesh is the living one. In the New Testament, flesh is the dead one. The spirit is the new one. Um, but you get the idea. The one that we were born with, that's the one that's corrupted by sin and must be exchanged. It must be removed and de destroyed and a new one placed in us. And again, he's not talking about the four-chambered chamber muscle that's within our chest, it's not, it's not like the heart organ, like the cardiologist type of heart. Heart means what? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's your soul, it's your spirit, it's, 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 it's our being. Uh, the Greek word there is psyche, right? Psyche, spirit. Um, He's going to give us a new one of those. And that's going to be by a different manner than he gave us our flesh. 
And so this is what Nicodemus is, is supposed to know and what Jesus marvels at. And thank you for pointing this out, by the way. Um, it was in the notes to go there, but I'm, it's even better when you, when you find it. <laughs> right, be, because for them, faith is a matter of the intellect. And indeed, the baby boys at eight days of age didn't decide to be circumcised. Right. Again, this was nothing new either. Or maybe, or maybe God creates the human being such that we get a burst of, of vitamin K at eight days of age in order to prepare them for the sign of, of the covenant that was to come. <laughs> but no, you're, you're right, yeah. At eight days of age, there's a burst of clotting. Yeah, so what, what does Matthew 28, 19, and 20 have to say? To be fair to those who, who, who would not baptize infants, what they're wanting to preserve is the idea that one cannot simply be washed in a rite and then have no discipleship. And in that, they're right. Which is why Jesus, when he institutes and commands baptism, doesn't simply say, baptize the nations. In the very same command, he says, disciple the nations by baptizing and by teaching. So yes, we baptize our babies, but then what do we do? We teach them, right? We raise them in the faith. We teach them how to hold their hands and how to pray and how to say amen. And then in time, they say the Lord's Prayer. And pretty soon, you start hearing little words showing up from the back pews during the Nicene Creed because they're picking up little things, and you'll hear like a sung amen. And all of a sudden, I'm chanting the words of institution, and I hear a voice in the back chanting along with me, and it's the greatest thing ever, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Sure, right. It's wonderful. And we all love it, and we should love it. It's beautiful. It, it shows that bringing the children to Jesus actually forms who they are. And as they sit through church, and frankly, as their mothers have to struggle and, and wrestle with them, they learn how to sit through church in time. Um, maybe by the time they're, you know, 50, 60. And... <laughs> But right, yeah, it's, it's so worth it, though, because when you hear that amen come from the kid or they, they say the Lord's Prayer, you're like, oh, wait a minute. And do they fully understand? No. Do I? Not really. But it's growing. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the link between baptism and, and re regeneration and justification and sanctification. Having been saved, now walk in. But not only, it's, it's not merely the command, it's the spirit that I put within you will help you walk in the way that I've laid before you. Yeah, Salvation. correct, yeah, right, Ex exactly, everything but in its order, salvation and then good works, right? Good works not as a result of, or salvation not as a result of good works, but as the fruit that flows out of it. Okay, um, Jesus, in verse 7, back, back to John chapter 3, by the way, um, he tells Nicodemus, after Nicodemus' second question, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And the reason is because, and Jesus uses an earthly example, right? The wind. You don't understand where the wind comes from or where the wind goes. But there is wind, and it does do things. Now, of course, we have much greater understanding, and we know how the wind works, right? Have they built a computer that can solve the three-body problem yet? Huh, so... There's actually plenty we don't know. So, this is also the way of the Spirit, that the Spirit works when and where He will. Why is that important for us to know? It's not when and where we will. It's not when and where we will. Well, he sure catches you by surprise sometimes. He often does. You find very unlikely believers all through the Bible, and people like Nicodemus, I mean, he's an obvious, if anyone should be a believer, it should be Nicodemus. But he just does not get it. Not yet. Not yet. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? It's a more humble question, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> he's, he's not sitting in judgment over Jesus anymore going, well, I mean, it's obvious you've come from God. You know, we have determined that. 
oh, oh, gr really great for you. Um, now it's, it's a Nicodemus is, is totally the student. How, how can this be? He's, he's not asserting anything. Exactly. Yeah. Nicodemus' thinking is entirely earthly, whereas what Jesus is describing is spiritual. Jesus answered him, verse 10, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Um, there's, there's plural here twice, by the way, which is not captured in modern English, but if it were written by a Southerner, it would have been, because Jesus says, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but y'all do not receive our testimony. In other words, Nicodemus and that group that you represent, y'all, plural, do not receive our testimony. Okay, well, we understand why Nicodemus is plural. He's speaking for a group. Why is Jesus plural? This is the tri, yes. He's speaking of the members of the Trinity, the, 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 the persons of the Godhead. Look, if a rabbi is going to pride himself on anything, it's going to be his knowledge of the scriptures, right? They're like seminarians. Let me show you what I know. And Jesus proves what you know ain't that much. Just like a seminarian. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It, it would have been a, a very strong rebuke because these are men who pride themselves. Their stock in trade is what we know. People would go and seek out a rabbi because he knew so much. As a matter of fact, Paul, when he was Saul, you know, Rabbi Saul, he was trained by Gamaliel. That's the kind of rabbi you wouldn't just stumble upon. You would go and seek him out. Very, very, very famous. Um, kind of like the, the, the Oxford University of... <laughs> of rabbis, right? Um, you, you don't just, it's not just, well, you know, that was, that was the closest school to where I grew up. No, no, you seek this one out, right? Um, yeah, th their knowledge is their stock and trade. That's, that's their coin of the realm. And by rebuking him for his knowledge, he's, he's absolutely cut Nicodemus off at the knees. Nicodemus is, is laid bare, right? Um, and, and what can he say? Oh, well, I actually knew that. No, I mean, Jesus has revealed that it's, it's not just that he forgot, you know, what kind of wood the ark was made of. He's missed something foundational in the Bible that he's spent his life reading. Which, to be fair, is a possibility for any one of us. There, there are times when, when all of a sudden we kind of snap to reality and, and we, oh, wait a minute. I've read this verse a hundred times and only now it's coming to light. That's an encouragement to keep reading the Bible, isn't it? Because there, there are always depths that we have not yet plumbed. And even if we're just being refreshed in what we already knew, hey, that's a blessing for, of its own kind, right? Um, but anyway, so Jesus is not, spec he, what he's saying is we're not speculating. This is not conjecture. This is not just, he's speaking of what we know and, and, and the persons of the Godhead bear witness because he's already spoken of the spirit. He's also spoken of himself. Now he's speaking of the Father. So in, in this, he is claiming to be divine. But you do not receive our testimony, which is exactly what John said at the very beginning of the gospel. He came into his own and his own did not receive him. Now, I think there is in the Nicodemus discourse a note of hopefulness. Because Nicodemus is willing to continue the questions. He's, he's willing to to take what Jesus is saying and, and, and consider them. Um, but, Jesus says, verse 12, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? In other words, if, if what you're really trying to get at by your knowledge is, is knowledge of God, your knowledge doesn't even tell you about how this world operates many cases. And yet you want to know the things of God. If you can't understand the things below, how can you understand the things above? And of course, by the Spirit including this in the Bible, he's asking you that question too. Well, 
Is it possible for you to understand heavenly things? Yes. How? By the spirit that God places within you at your baptism. Because when you see this, you go, well, that's obviously baptism. It's not obvious to those who do not possess the spirit. Which is why you can talk to a perfectly intelligent unbeliever and walk through the faith in a simple way and it's going to seem like foolishness. Now verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. All right. So, um, yes, what does it mean to be lifted up? This is the cross, right? Now, the, the event that Jesus is talking about, he says, Moses lifted up the serpent. And again, here's back to that theme where Jesus is coming to fulfill what, what began in Moses, right? So there's, there was a, a, a promise of a prophet that was like unto Moses. That's going to be Jesus. And not just like him in that he gives God's law, but here, Moses takes the bronze serpent, lifts it up in the wilderness, and what happens? Those, yeah, those who look on the brazen serpent will live. And so Jesus says, what is going to be lifted up? Jesus. The one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Right? What does it mean that he descended from heaven? What's that referring to? The incarnation, exactly. That's exactly it. So the, 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 the text that is used to translate um, is, is probably not the best one to have used. <laughs> the, the, the better Greek texts have an extra verse or an extra phrase in there, which really should have been left in, and that would make it read, No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, who is in heaven. So the Son of Man descended from heaven and is in heaven. What is that a confession of? His divinity. The two natures of Christ. He descends from heaven, that is, he takes up human flesh, that's the incarnation, and yet he is in heaven, which is to say he is at the Father's side. He's, he's in the, the bosom of the Father. That's his divinity. He is both God and man. Does the New King James have that in there? Yes. I've, I assumed it did. King James did. Well, yeah, definitely. Some of these things we know we just haven't heard it quite right. now. Right. Yeah. Nicodemus had that problem. <laughs> but, but, we, but we all do. We're, Nicodemus is not unique. We all have this, where there's Bible that we've read a hundred times, and just the hundred and first time something sticks out, either it's explained in a different way or we have a different translation or life just causes you to think about things differently, whatever it is. Oh, yeah. But that's, that's hope for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's much we don't know, but we can still learn, as, as Nicodemus did. So, yeah, you, the, what is going to be lifted up is the Son of Man who descended from heaven and who is in heaven, right? And this is on the cross. And the promise is, here in verse 15, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Not whoever does, makes the decision. Right, not whoever makes the decision, not whoever does good works, not whoever is born of the right family, whatever. Whoever believes in him. And lest that be unclear, next week when we pick up verse 16, That'll be made explicit. All right, let's uh, close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.